Gracious Father in heaven, we just want to thank you. We want to start the day off by thanking you for everything that you're doing in and around and for us, God, whether we see it or not. Lord, we just ask that you fill us with your Holy Spirit this morning in our worship so that we may give you all the great glory and honor and blessing that you so richly deserve. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
your people. Father, we just thank you today. We thank you today for all of your blessings. Hallelujah.
the king. We cry glory to the king. Let's just cry glory to the king. Father, we just thank you. Glory to you, Father. We praise you today in this house, Father. We just give you glory today in Jesus' precious name. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord.
Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, again, we just thank you that we're able to gather as a people for the rain, for the answered prayers, for, the, for life. And God, we ask that your word shines forth this morning, that we learn and we hear from you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, start right off with a review. So last week we talked about fathers and the need for God's people to be courageous in today's world. Courage is, is not devoid of masculinity. We have to have courage in order, as uh, specifically speaking to the men, we have to have courage to be men. And we find that in the scriptures, there's a lot of good worth fighting for in the world, and I, I really pray that God makes that clear to all of us, wherever you've been called, uh, I pray that God makes you a brave beacon of hope to shine in the world around you. So two weeks ago, we finished the Apostles' Creed, and so this morning we are beginning a new series, and this series is right before you. It's a study in the book of James, and we're going to call it Faith in action. Faith in action. So when we look at the epistle or the letter of James, we can't help but notice the number of imperative statements that he uses. An imperative means a command like this. Be a doer of the word. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Be patient. Be firm because the Lord's coming is near. And on and on, we see that, that kind of commanding tone, that imperative tone throughout the book of James. And I tell you, that tone is a good thing. That tone is a good thing. When I first came to the Lord, this was one of my favorite books of the Bible because the wisdom is extremely practical. The, the issue with James is not that you don't understand. The issue is that it's difficult to put into practice. Amen? But this is a kind of a letter written like a sermon or even, even a series of sermons. It, it speaks a lot to how we should live where God has called us. And so I would say, put it this way. If the book of Proverbs were written like a New Testament letter, we would probably end up with something like the book of James. So if you turn in your Bible to James chapter 1, we're going to be looking at the first four verses this morning. And our message is entitled, as you saw, Trials are necessary. Trials are necessary. Times of testing are not optional. And I'll say they're probably not always enjoyable. But this stands in stark contrast to that idea. They are a vital part of the Christian life. Trials are needed for our growth in the things of the Lord. So let's go ahead and let's read James 1 through 4 together. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Amen. It's the word of the Lord. This is a great passage of scripture. Some of you have it memorized, no doubt. And looking at verse 1, we see James calling himself a servant of God. A servant. Church history records James as James the Just. It's kind of a cool name. I want to be Hank the Humble. <laughs> but I realize in saying that, that I'm not. The thing with James the Just is he says, it, uh, the church history, Eusebius uh, Josephus records that he prayed to the point where his knees were calloused. Some tough knees. Now there's more than one James in the Bible. As you know, most scholars believe this to be the half-brother of Jesus. So imagine, think about that for a second. Imagine growing up being the brother of Jesus. I have a feeling Jesus would have been easy to get along with himself. Since he never sinned, 
Jesus never had any problems with anybody. But no doubt it would have been difficult to hear your brother saying, as he grew up, saying he was God. Apparently, Jesus' brothers didn't always believe in him because in John 7, 5, the Bible says, for even his brothers didn't believe in him. Didn't come out of the gate believing. And James was among those who didn't always believe in Jesus. But it didn't stay that way. So later in life, and we have it recorded right in front of us here in the Bible, he calls himself a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus' half-brother went from being a skeptic to a servant. He went from viewing him as just another one of his brothers, whom he loved. I'm running out of jokes with the microphone, so just get used to it. Just pretend that I said something really important when it does that, even if it does it like multiple times. He went from viewing him as just another one of his brothers to his only Lord. And so I want you to take that as an encouragement. I want you to take that as an encouragement. God can turn any skeptic into a servant. Any skeptic. Some of your translations might have bondservant or even stronger tones like slave, and that's fine. Those, those words all mean the same thing. Any son or daughter of the Most High should consider it a blessing to be called God's servant. There's no higher calling. Serving the kingdom is a privilege, and servants of God are sons and daughters of God. So what a grace it is, as we often mention. It's a grace to call Jesus Lord. Amen? So notice that James doesn't address this letter to a specific church. He doesn't have to, because he's writing to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, or you might have diaspora. Some of your Bibles have it translated for you, and it says it simply means the people of God scattered among the nations, dispersed among the nations. Well, the focus of the letter was probably a predominantly Jewish audience. James is writing to the spiritual Israel, the Israel of God, Paul says, and those are us who have been born again from the heart to a new hope. Most letters in the New Testament start with a longer greeting, but this is not the case with James. A guy with callous knees doesn't waste any time. He jumps right into exhortation in verse 2. So let's go ahead and jump in as well. He says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. So that brings us to the first point. Trials are inevitable, but they can always be experienced with joy. Amen? Inevitable. That means they're going to happen. It's not avoidable. Do we believe this, though, that it can be experienced with joy? Can we, can we really count it all joy when the trials of life show up? A trial, in this case, means a testing or a proving. Again, some translations have temptations, and that's fine. It doesn't lose any meaning with that word. What kind of trial or test, test is James talking about? What is this? Is this I, I think this is a little bit deeper than trying to decide which ice cream cone to select. So given the time that this was written, most likely sometime between 8040 and 8060, we have an idea of the kind of things the early church was dealing with. They were enduring persecution. They were separated from each other. They were scattered. They were probably facing poverty, sickness, loneliness, pain, loss of life, suffering. You know, it's a blessing. Don't take it for granted if your whole household calls upon the Lord as their Savior and Lord. Take that as a blessing, because that's not always the case. And so I think that might have been going on here. There was probably division from loved ones over issues of belief. Probably some spiritual funerals had for believers who had adopted Christianity from Judaism. So no doubt this is a time of immense physical and mental emotional pain. So what about you? 
have you, have you been going through a difficult time and thought, you know, why are all these bad things happening to me? Right? Have you been there? Why all the pain? Have you felt like the prophet Jeremiah? Maybe it's a little more noble. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all the treacherous thrive? Why all the suffering? Why the inconvenient interruptions? Why the bad news laced upon bad news? Does God even hear me anymore? You see, the Christian life has that tension because we know the character of God, right? We serve a good God, and we know he's a good God. He's faithful. But good things, from our perspective, don't always look good, right? And unfortunately, that can cause even the best of us to question the goodness of God. And it ought not to be that way. We need to get our definition of good in line with what God says is truly good. You need to get your definition, and whether it's anything, whether it's good, whether it's when we're, de- we're defining a man, whether we're defining a woman, your definition needs to get in line with the definition that God has given us in the Holy Scriptures. Otherwise, it's an opinion. So that's exactly what James is is actually trying to communicate to us. He says, we have something that the world doesn't have. Right? We have something that the world doesn't have. We have a relationship with God. That's huge. We have trials, and God is not just our Lord, and he's the greatest Lord you can ever serve. He's the ruler of the kings of the earth. All the kings of the earth will bow to the king that sits at the right hand of God. But he's also your friend. And that is profound. We can cast our cares on him because he tells us he cares for you. He is brother, shepherd, and friend. He's with us through the trials, and perhaps that's the motivation behind a hymn such as, what a friend we have in Jesus. Some of you already have it in your head. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. And so we ask ourselves from the heart, can we find a friend so faithful Who will all our sorrows share? Jesus is a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He knows what you're going through. Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. What a privilege it is to have a personal, intimate relationship with God himself. It's crucial that we understand that these trials that we face, these difficulties... Temptations. They're not optional. They're not optional, guys. The Bible tells us to count it all joy if you face a trial. No, it doesn't. It says count it all joy when you face trials. In this world, we will have trouble, right? But if you know the Lord, then you know that trouble has been overcome. You have a problem? Are you going through a trial right now? Do you have a temptation that you're dealing with right now? Ask yourself, have I gone to the Lord about this yet? Take it to the Lord in prayer. You will not find a friend so faithful as the Lord himself. Whatever the situation may be, whether you feel near to God or far from God, if you have confessed him Lord and are trusting in him in the heart, he is near to you. Near to my heart was the blood applied. And you can say from that heart, glory to his name, no matter what adversity shows up on your doorstep. That's why we get the privilege of joy in the suffering. Who can do that? It doesn't make sense. Joy in the suffering, joy through difficulty. And so depending on your translation uh, of verse 2, you might have pure joy, uh, great joy, 
I, I believe ESV, King James, New American Standard, all capture this best because it uses the right word, count it all joy, all of it, all of it, okay? So that, that's not a small joy. And the Greek word there, that's what it means. It's pos, and it means the whole thing, every bit. The fullness of joy. Count all of it joy when trials come your way. Are we, are we getting that? Are we getting that? Does this, does this mean that I'm supposed to be happy when I'm in pain or take some sick pleasure in being harmed? No. That's, that, is, uh, that thinking is mentally unstable, and that's not what he's talking about. What it does mean is when these trials do come our way, we have a better way to handle them. There's another way to deal with troubles. There's a better way than complaining. Does complaining ever make anything better? It's a better way than despairing. There's the joy approach. The joy approach. The most difficult, but the most rewarding approach there is. And it's hard to understand that without continuing in the passage. The reason for trials such as these, it's found in verse 3. Verse 3. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Or the NIV, I think, I think the word, the last word is a little bit easier to understand in the NIV. The testing of your faith produces perseverance. Perseverance. So what does that tell us? It tells us that God is working through all the messy stuff. He, pull, he reaches down into the muck and the mire and he's pulling us out. So did you know that God cares about your character? Though we get so easily wrapped up in other things, we care about a lot of things. And sometimes we overlook our character. Well, God cares greatly about how we conduct ourselves. That was an important one. <laughs> Romans 5, 3 through 4 says, not only that, Romans 5, 3 through 4, I said that kind of fast. But we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. You could also say perseverance. When trials come, do we react differently than those who don't know God? Do we look like everybody else when the trial shows up? Do our suffering, do we suffer in the same way? Do we approach the trial in the same way? Or do we approach our trial in joy? Do we keep a heavenly mind toward things when they show up? Do we turn our eyes upon Jesus when the things of the earth are growing dim? God cares about our character. And we have to remember that trials are necessary. They're necessary. So before we get to the next point, I, I want you to see that that's not my words. In 1 Peter 1, 4 through 6, and we should be able to get that up. There it is. 1 Peter 1, 4 through 6. We have been called to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice. Though now for a little while, what's that? If necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So that tells you right, right there, if you have a trial, that means it must be necessary. And that it's possible to rejoice through it. If, if we're dealing with pain or suffering, then that means that the pain has a point. It means that there's a reason behind it, even though we don't always know what that reason is. And that's sometimes hard to swallow. Right? But then we remember that God is good. Again. He has been kind, and he was willing to suffer for us. Jesus went through trials and temptations. 
joy is the serious business of heaven, C.S. Lewis said. And so we need to fix our eyes firmly upon the divine mission. Sickness, pain, sorrow, death, it won't dwell in the inheritance that is reserved for you and for me. It's undefiled, it's unfading, it's kept, up, it's kept for us. He's keeping it. And it will be revealed at just the right time because that's how God works. God shows up at exactly the right time. He's never late, he's never early. But if you start to doubt, look at Jesus. If you start to doubt, man, I've got it really bad, I want you to look at the life of Jesus. God endured wrath he didn't deserve And so we can look to Christ who, for the joy that was set before him, that's what it was, it was the joy set before him, bringing many sons and daughters to glory, he endured the cross, he persevered in the suffering. And that brings us to the second point. Enduring trials will cause our faith to grow, which leads to maturity. Maturity. The testing of your faith puts it into action, right? Suffering is like a training ground for faithfulness. Pliable people flee when pain takes over for pleasure. I'll say that again. Pliable people flee when pain takes over for pleasure. It's a lot of P's, but I think you get the point. To be pliable means to be flexible. It means when the going gets tough, the tough don't the, the tough stay, the pliable don't. Do you fold when the going gets tough? And do you remember that there are things that are more valuable than pleasure and comfort? Suffering can either strengthen our faith in God or it will strengthen our doubt in Him. Trials put faith to the test. And so for those in academics or any of us who have been in academics, why do we take tests? If you're a teacher, why do you give a test? What are you trying to, what are you checking? You're trying to make sure that they understand the material that they were taught. And when we receive a trial, it's a test. Can you take it? Are you getting it? You don't, it's going to be hard to know if you're patient if you've never been put in a situation where you might be tempted to be impatient. How would you know? Can we persevere when things get tough? So verse 12, if you're looking at your Bible in James, if you jump down to verse 12, it says this. It says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. So if we possess steadfastness or endurance or perseverance or constancy, it will likely result in a staying on the path. So being this type of person means that we won't, we won't swerve away from the purpose in life. We're not tossed to and fro by everything that comes our way. We won't deviate from the path that God has called us to. And this exhortation is not just for clergy. This is for everybody. This is for everybody. God calls us all to grow into maturity. That's a good thing. Amen? So, verse 4. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And yes, I, I really like the ESV, but I just felt like that these last two verses at the NIV, it's clearer, it's easier to understand. The NIV, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. So this word for perfect, it can also be rendered mature. Coming to its completion. It's the same word Jesus used in the Sermon on the Mount when he said to his followers, you must therefore be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Does that verse scare you? 
you must be perfect, like your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, I know there's going to be some tension here because of our faithfulness to the gospel message. Amen? You can't be perfect. We'll just start right off with it. You can't. Bible said, or Augustus Topley, Rock of Ages, not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Jesus paid it all. Not some of it, all of it. The debt is paid in full, and nothing but the blood of Jesus can save my soul. Amen? Amen. Faithful to the gospel message. You have to stay, if you, if you lose sight of the gospel, you lose everything. I, Paul, Paul understood this clearly. He said, I desire to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. We have to keep that foundation. Preach the gospel to yourself daily. Now, by faith we have been made right with God. And even, in, even James, James even says himself, even though he comes across with this commanding imperative stone, he says, in chapter 3, he says something like this. He says, we all stumble in many ways. So James acknowledges this, that you're not perfect. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, also able to bridle his whole body, to the point that no one can tame the tongue. And we do stumble. Anybody here tame their tongue? You ever say something you want to take it back? I do it all the time. The problem is everybody can hear it when I say it. We all fall short. Now, I've, I think I've laid the groundwork. I don't want you to run away, though, from the imperative too quickly. You want to be salty? You want to be light in this culture? Don't run away from this imperative right here. James is challenging us to make it a goal to be per perfect, to be complete. And this verse, if I could, if, if, if we could boil it down to this, I, th I think it's all about mindset. Mindset, okay? What are you aiming at? You know, press on, push forward. We know that sinless perfection is impossible. Anyone who says they're without sin, John writes, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Sin is going to happen, you're going to fail, but you might, if you're so quick to jump to that, when you get an imperative in the scripture, or a command, then you might want to rewire your thinking. What do I mean? There's a big difference between a mind that reacts to sin like this, like this, here we go. Well, we're all in sinners anyway, right? I'm going to sin, you're going to sin. Don't worry about a little sin here, a little sin there. God's going to forgive us anyway. Why would I try not to sin when I'm just going to do it anyway? Let's, let, let's sin so that grace may abound. That kind of mentality gives up before the fight even starts. What if we thought like this instead? I want to do the best I can for the Lord. This life is his life because he purchased me. I'm his servant. I'm not my own, and I belong to God. And I should make it my goal to please him because I want to. I know I sin, but I don't want to sin. I want to be like my heavenly father. Who do you think, if that's in the mind, who do you think is going to be more effective for kingdom work? Can you be perfect in this life? No. And please don't take me out of context because this sound, if somebody was like uh, uh, video editing or uh, sound biting, they, they could really make me sound like a bad guy right here. Please don't take this out of context. No, you can't be perfect, but it doesn't hurt to try. That's scary, isn't it? The perfectionist, if you're a perfectionist, you know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? There's no sense in doing something if you're not going to do it right. Does that appeal to you? We ought to shoot for the moon. Because if we do, 
will land among the stars. But I want to be better than the stars. Be careful. Be careful. Now, some of you, you might have, you might have like an inner critic going off right now thinking about all the ways that you can do better. That's where your mind goes. Well, well, how, well, okay, I'm messing up here, I'm messing up there. Perfect doesn't exist, but hey, I won't know what perfect is unless I try to shoot for perfect. And part of that, guys, that's not a bad thing. It's bad if it's a performance. If it's trying to earn your way to God, then it's bad. Strive, press on, be steadfast, immovable, endure trials, persevere in what God has called you to do. And all the while, you've got to stay rooted in that gospel. Christ died for me, and so I want to live for him. I cannot add to what he's done, but he is worthy of all I can give. I want to put my faith into action. I want to show myself his workmanship, always remembering that grace Grace requires nothing of me. Whew. It's grace that's brought me safe thus far, not any of the labor of my hands, and it's grace that's leading me home. Amen. Don't give sin more power than it has. If we start with the premise of there's no reason to even try, then we won't try. Holiness in 2022? Forget it. No. Forget that. Forget that. Get thee behind me, Satan. That's a defeatist thinking. Are we a defeatist people? Who wins in the end? Well, yeah, we do, but because of him. We don't get any of the credit. The king is alive. Amen. Jesus is alive. Every other king I know, he died, he didn't come back to life. Your king defeated the grave. The grace to live courageously for the kingdom is available. The Holy Spirit is with us wherever we go. Wherever we go. I've heard Pastor Lon say this, and I believe Earl Kellum originally said it. It's something like this. We want to do the maximum for the Lord, and we want to do it with excellence. Right? I hope that you put that. Make that a goal. Every person, every, every athlete in the room right now knows what I'm talking about. Every person that likes competition gets it. You know, what kind of motivational speaker would get up and start telling everybody, hey, you're not cool and you're never going to be like me. You don't really have potential. That's not how they make their money. They got to tell you stuff even if they don't believe it. It's like, man, you look like you've really got it together. You just follow these five steps, you're going to be the most awesome person that God has ever graced on this earth. That's what they do. They talk you up. They motivate you. Sometimes it's malarkey. If anybody ever tells you that you're the most awesome person on the earth, walk away. Awe belongs to the Lord. You know, every person that likes competition, your athletes, your sports enthusiasts, they get this. They, they get the same kind of... Now, now, take that tenacity. Take that, like if you're really passionate about something, take that tenacity and apply it to your faith. Put your faith in action. If we would delight ourselves in the Lord, he will give us the desires of our hearts. And those desires are truer when Jesus Christ is the greatest desire. High King of Heaven, my treasure, thou art. To know him, to make him known is a strange, paradoxical thing. It's, it's like... It's like I want, I, I'm dissatisfied the more I know him, but I'm also more satisfied than I've ever been. We always want more of him, but feel less and less like we need anything else. So what do we want our lives to be about? And what do we want people to remember us for? So Paul, the great example of enduring hardship, he went to jail on several occasions, he was beaten, he was stoned, he was mocked. 
thrown out of town, got back up and went back in. Stephen was stoned to death. Job, have you considered God's servant Job? Why did Job have to go through trials? Was it because everything was bad? No, in Job's case, everything was right. What about the martyrs? If we could resurrect some of the faith's martyrs, I think they'd be glad to go and do it again. Point me to the battlefield where I can give my all to the Lord. And that's because they understand this. They understand that the testing that they face have an eternal weight of glory. Eternal. It's not going to turn to straw and burn up in the end. It's going to last forever. So I have to ask you, do you want it? Do you want it? Do you want that kind of life? Do you, do you want the Holy Spirit power to face life in that bold way and not just say it, but mean it? Like, I want, to, I want to deal with whatever may come my way. Then when you read the Bible, here's what you do. When you read the Bible and it says something about holiness or perfection or maturity, don't give up before the battle starts. Ask God to help you through the trial. Ask God to give you grace through the trial. Take it to the Lord in prayer. God, I can't be perfect, but I want to be. Boy, that wanting will make all the difference in how you live. Enduring trials make us grow in the faith and our hope in the Lord. Romans 15. I think we have this one. Romans 15, 4 through 6. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in according with Christ Jesus, that together you may voice glor- with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. And so you come back to the trials. How do you know if you're patient, if your patience has never been challenged? How do you know if you're self-controlled, if you've never been put in a position to overindulge? How do you know that you're faithful if you've never actually had to do anything that costs you for your faith. God is sovereign, church. Amen? That's a good thing. He can do all things. And, and, and maybe some of the stuff that you're thinking when, when you think of trials, you have the negative mentality. Of, well, none of this applies to me. Or, or if you only knew, if you only knew what I was going through, you wouldn't say that. I don't have to know. God knows. And he does know. And he cares. And he's working. So I want you to take your cares to him. And I want you to trust my faith. Maybe your faith is having a trial right now. And I want you to trust that he's going to come through at exactly the right time. Because he will. Worship team, come up. Trials are necessary because we have them. The proof is in the pudding. Again, we also know that we can experience joy through them. God doesn't command these things just for fun. He's telling you that you can do it and it's possible. Count it all joy when a trial shows up, when hardship shows up. We need to press on for that upward call. We have a great hope in Jesus. We have a great friend in Jesus. And I pray as we go through this, I pray that James inspires us to live boldly for God no matter what the culture says. No matter what anybody says. You know, I know a lot of people that are not afraid to be bold about things that are shameful. It's a time, maybe it's a test of faith, 
that we need to bold, be bold for righteousness and be bold in love. Amen? For, we are working for God. Salvation is secure. Don't let the free gift of God stop you from wanting to strive to be more like him. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for these great truths that we have something, that we have something so near and dear. We have a great friend in the king of the world, and you care for us. And so this, this knowing that you care, this knowing that you're good, Lord, just plant that deep down into our hearts. So that whatever may come, we can respond to that situation with faith. We can respond with faith that looks like incomprehensible joy. Because God, you are working all things together for us. For our good. And for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.